Okay, so I um, um, welcome uh, everyone. My name is Griet van Keerbergen and I'm the coordinator of the Global Antiquities Research Group um, within the YMP Lind Center at McGill University. And uh, we're, you know, we're very happy today to be able to start an exciting new um, series, which will be on slavery in the ancient world. So we'll have two talks um, in the series uh, on the Mediterranean, and then we'll have two um, talks on China. And the talks are about once every month. I'm sure you've all, all seen the poster and you can um, you know, register for individual talks or for the whole series um, with, um, with Nina, who's, um, who's been helping us greatly and who I really would like to uh, thank for her, uh, for her help with all of this. Um, I'm going to, uh, we're, so this is an initiative of Global Antiquities uh, in collaboration with um, uh, Classics at McGill. And very shortly, I'm going to pass the word to my uh, colleague, Professor Anastasiadis, uh, who will be introducing our first speaker and who will also be uh, moderating the Q&A. Um, I just wanted to let you know in terms of the Q&A, the way we will operate is uh, please write a message, a chat message to Professor Anastasiadis if you would like to raise a question. You don't need to write the actual question in the chat. Uh, just say, I would like to ask a question and he will, um, he will unmute you or ask you to unmute yourself um, so you can raise your uh, question with, um, you know, with your own, uh, with your own uh, voice. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass um, uh, the floor to Professor Anastasiadis. Um, uh, so please, uh, uh, Tassos, uh, take over from me. Well, uh, thank you, Hrit. And uh, I'm also happy on behalf of the program of classical studies at McGill within the Department of History and Classical Studies which I'm uh, a director right now to welcome everybody to this series and thank, of course, uh, Global Antiquities for accepting to partner and, and like initiating this uh, new uh, series of talks, of talks on a very uh, topical well, uh, theme. Um, so um, without uh, further I mean, discussion, I would like to present a little bit our speaker. So Kostas Vlasopoulos and welcome him here uh, with us, who's our first speaker. So Kostas Vlasopoulos is uh, Associate Professor of Asian History at the University of Crete. After having spent numerous years as professor at Nauticum, uh, following his uh, PhD at Cambridge, now uh, um, being here at McGill with minus 16 right now, I can not blame him also for like, leaving Nauticum to go to Crete to teach. Uh, but um, his research interests include the uh, variety of topics, uh, history of slavery more lately, but before that history of intercultural relations in antiquity. I would like to stress here and uh, underline a certain number of, uh, of his uh, previous works. He's the author of, of Unthinking the Greek Polis, Ancient Greek History Beyond Euro Eurocentrism, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2007. And it was clearly a provocative book. Um, as he says himself, I have not attempted to rewrite Greek history from a different perspective in this study. I have merely tried to show that the perspective is deeply problematic and that an alternative perspective is both feasible and illuminating. But as the English say, the proof is of the pudding is in the eating. Now I can tell you I ate it, and though I'm not a specialist of ancient Greek history, it's a fascinating study. Um, as one reviewer said, anyone interested in Greek history will be stimulated by Vlasopoulos' book. Historiographers and theorists like Vlasopoulos should come together not to unthink, but to rethink the Greek polis. He then moved on to Greeks and Barbarians, uh, book published uh, for in 2013, also by Cambridge University Press. This time, it's a book that put him on a path which includes uh, such great scholars and giants as Arnando Momigliano. And uh, this book uh, was an ambitious synthesis of the social, economic, political, and cultural interactions between Greeks and not Greeks in the Mediterranean world um, during all the periods almost of ancient Greek history. And as one again, as again, as one reviewer said, instead of traditional and static distinctions between Greeks and others, 
Professor Vlasopoulos explores the diversity of interactions between Greeks and non-Greeks in four parallel but interconnected worlds. The world of networks, the world of Apikie, the colonies, the Panhellenic world, and the world of empires. I can tell you that uh, also for a book that is not mentioned in his, uh, in his uh, short bio, and it can only be short that we published up for that flyer, is so it's also one that I use for my Antiquity in the European Imaginary Seminar class. I have the pleasure to use that work. Well, it's on a very, a very important topic, the legacy of Sparta in particular. And uh, it's also this discussion um, about what is, what is the, what, how has Sparta been understood and its history written and rewritten that is really fascinating. Now he has moved to a new hot topic over the last few years, which is about the history of ancient slavery in the, Medi in the, in the Mediterranean world. So with three books that came out uh, one after another, I'm like, you know, almost awed like at the rhythm that he's publishing. So uh, my whole life is stories from the everyday life of ancient slaves, which appeared in Greek in 2020. Um, historicizing ancient slavery by Edinburgh University Press in 2021. And once again here, somebody says, there's no better book for showcasing the current state of ferment in the field of ancient Mediterranean slavery. Both newcomers and seasoned scholars will find much of value here. And he makes a compelling case that a new paradigm for studying ancient slavery is needed. And he definitely outlines just such a framework. But this is a book about writing the history of slavery, not a history of slavery, and needs to be viewed as a prolegomena for a more ambitious project that I hope he has now started or taking under consideration and continuing, and I'm sure that he's going to be talking more about it with us today. So please join me in welcoming Professor Vlasopoulos, because we're very happy to have you with us. Uh, well, yes, uh, let me start by thanking Hiet uh, and Tassos for the invitation. And let me say how uh, wonderful it is. I've been to many conferences and series about slavery. They're either about ancient slavery or there are about ancient slavery and slavery in the new world. What you're trying to do here is really, uh, as far as I can tell, unprecedented. Uh, I'm delighted to be in a series that uh, looks at slavery uh, in the different parts of uh, ancient Eurasia. I think this is extremely important and I hope I will be able to uh, participate, uh, to listen to the, the, the other papers uh, you have in the series, because this is precisely the sort of dialogue we, we, we really uh, need. Um, well, as uh, Tassos hinted in the introduction, and to paraphrase uh, Martin Luther King, I have a pipe dream, uh, which is, uh, it's a mad project about a, a, a history uh, of ancient slavery in the very long term. Uh, slavery, uh, ancient slavery uh, and global history, uh, slaving in Eurasia, Western Eurasia and Africa from 2000 BC to 1000 CE. Of course, it's as mad as it sounds, but the major problem of such a project is how to write it, how to insert slaves, not merely as objects of uh, exploitation and domination, but as active agents in the changing history of ancient societies and cultures. Uh, the presentation today is a sort of work in progress in terms of finding the means, the concepts, the ways uh, of achieving that end. And of course, it's difficult for all sorts of reasons that will appear, but at the same time, I think it's something feasible and something necessary uh, for the study of slavery, but also for the study of the ancient world in all its uh, facets. So let me share the uh, PowerPoint. I uh, hope you can see it. Yes, okay, good. Okay, so um, I shouldn't be saying these things, but sometimes they need to be said. Uh, historiography is a discipline with a very long history, uh, going back to uh, antiquity, but for most of its history, uh, it was effectively tantamount to history from above. And that, of course, meant a focus on political and military history, a focus on ancient states and on the elites that rule them, and, of course, a focus on the powerful and the wealthy. It is quite recent that different kinds of questions have been asked or have been made an important part of what it means to study ancient history. 
and I start uh, this uh, quest with a famous poem by the uh, German poet Bertolt Brecht uh, called Questions of a Reading Worker. Who built seven gate thieves? In the books, there are the names of kings. Did the kings hold the boulders? And Babylon, several times destroyed, who rebuilt it so many times? Great Rome is full of triumphal arches. Who built them? Over whom did the Caesars triumph? Did much praised Byzantium have only palaces for its inhabitants? Even in legendary Atlantis, the night when the sea swallowed it up, those who were drowning sold it for their slaves. Young Alexander conquered India. He alone? Caesar beat the goals. Did he not at least have a cook with him? So many reports, so many questions. It was exactly the attempt to answer those kind of questions that effectively from the 60s onwards created a different approach uh, to history, what we can call history from below. Uh, and that included a number of developments, partly it included the extension of the historical discipline to new fields, economic history, social history, cultural history, and so on. But it also meant, uh, for the first time, a focus on social groups beyond the usual focus on the elites, women, the poor, slaves, ethnic and racial minorities. This is something that has happened, of course, in the study of antiquity, in the, in the study of classical antiquity in Western uh, Eurasia. A huge number of uh, studies have emerged in the last 40 years that uh, look at history from below in antiquity. The problem is that there is an almost complete dissociation between those works and narrative history. Open any account of narrative history of ancient societies and slaves are mostly absent. Costa, this is because- Costa, excuse me, if I can interrupt you, you just need to like yeah. either scroll down your slides or to, if you're keeping it or, or launch the PowerPoint so that we, we can be moving from one slide to another. And because right now you, you're only you're still on slide two. This is absurd for the interruption, but you need to select, you know, okay. from, scroll down your slides or launch the PowerPoint. Yeah. The one or the other. So you still see what the second? Uh... I still see the second one. Have you launched the PowerPoint? Is that what you did? I'm sorry for the interruption. Yes. Uh... I, because it's because in preferences you're in um, uh, you, you in preferences you are not on presenter mode you 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 need to so don't launch it necessarily keep it on keep it on normal on your on your screen and then just scroll down the slides one by one or if not you need to change yeah the preferences sorry I didn't quite understand what I'm supposed to do all right um, uh, uh, unlaunch it keep it on your screen as if it's normal. And I, you can you can and then uh, and then and then you even by sharing it you can move down this the this the slides one by one by the on the side by scrolling the bar down. Sorry. Okay. For so can can you see now the? Uh... Yes. Now now you're on slide three, and then you can move down to slide four. Yes. Exactly. Okay. You see? Slide four. Right. Okay. So so now it's visible. Yeah, you can use this, the scroll bar that you have there to just move it around. Yes, exactly that way. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Fine. Like, sorry, sorry. Uh, so, I was just saying, no problem. I was just saying that despite the huge amount of work on history of, uh, from below, uh, for example, uh, looking at slaves, there is still an almost complete dissociation between that work and narrative histories of the ancient world. Open any narrative history, modern narrative history of ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and so on and so forth slaves are almost invisible in such accounts and the reason for that is that history from below until now is mostly results in synchronic terms as an account of history in classical in the classical period or in the hellenistic period or in the roman imperial period and we still are looking for ways of integrating narrative history and the history of events with synchronic accounts uh, that uh, look at uh, wider images. Um, one major reason for this dissociation has to do with the sources, the kind of sources we have for the study of ancient slaves, and, and a number of problems for integrating those sources with narrative histories. What are the main sources we have for studying uh, ancient uh, 
slaves. Uh, we have manumission inscriptions recording the manumission of uh, slaves and the conditions attached to them. We have epitaphs when slaves died and people commemorated them. We have letters uh, slaves wrote or letters that mention slaves. We have local pieces that usually mention slaves and Passan. Uh, we have literary texts that present often fictional slaves, usually uh, commonly as uh, protagonists of various uh, stories. We have images uh, and we have artifacts uh, created by slaves. It's much easier to bring all these things together in a synchronic account of slavery in ancient Rome or slavery in classical Athens than to integrate those kinds of sources into a diachronic uh, narrative. A second major problem, and one I will spend quite some time uh, dealing with uh, in this presentation, is the often futile sense uh, that uh, looks and searches for conflicts, conflicts in which slaves as a whole class uh, confront masters as a whole class. This is not something that never happened. There are occasions in which that sort of thing happened. You might know of the three famous slave revolts in uh, antiquity, Spartacus, the revolt of Spartacus is of course the most famous of them, and a wonderful movie uh, that uh, you should all see if you haven't seen. Uh, but it's the exception. If we want to study the agency of slaves uh, in ancient history, we should move beyond this kind of general conflict between all slaves on the one hand and the masters on the other, and try to look at the various kinds of historical processes and the various kinds of conflicts in which slaves were one part and often with very important uh, consequences. So this is the sort of question I will try to explore. I will uh, try to look at the impact of slave agency uh, in uh, political history, in cultural history, in religious history, and so on and so forth, and try to summarize this uh, sort of uh, issues towards the end of this uh, presentation. I will spend quite some time with one of the most famous events uh, of ancient history, which is, of course, the Peloponnesian War between the Athenians and the Spartans, the two most important uh, Greek uh, city-states in the later uh, 5th century BC, more specifically between 431 and 404 uh, BC. Uh, it's one of the most famous uh, wars in antiquity because, of course, uh, Thucydides, the most famous uh, Greek historian, wrote uh, an account of a significant part of this uh, war. Uh, a huge number of books and articles have been written about the Peloponnesian War, but as I said, slaves are effectively invisible in those accounts, despite the fact that, as I will show to you, there's a huge amount of evidence that can be used to study the consequences of slave agency in the uh, course and in the outcome of the Peloponnesian War. So to start with, the Peloponnesian War was a conflict between the Athenians and their allies, and the Spartans and their allies. It was a geopolitical conflict, and uh, slavery was not uh, one of the main uh, issues in that conflict. Nevertheless, the agency of slaves played an, 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 a not insignificant role in the outbreak of the war. Uh, we are told uh, that one of the crucial developments that led to the war was the famous Megarian decree, a decree passed by the Athenians that stopped the inhabitants of the neighbor city of Megara uh, from being able uh, to uh, participate, uh, to visit the uh, markets of Athens and the other cities in the empire, which caused the Spartans to declare war uh, to the Athenians. One of the reasons that the Athenians uh, passed the Megarian decree was that Athenian fugitive slaves fled Athens and found refuge in Megara. So the agency of slaves fleeing their Athenian masters was one of the many reasons, not the most significant, but one of the reasons that led to the outbreak of the war. Now, of course, slaves were crucial in all aspects of everyday life in the course of the war. As we will see later, slaves worked in the Athenian mines, uh, whose uh, silver output was crucial for the ability of the Athenians to fund 
uh, the activities of the war. Uh, slaves played an important role in building work. For example, part of what you see these days in the Athenian Acropolis was built uh, during the Peloponnesian War, and slaves were a significant part of the workforce uh, that built the Erechtheion, one of the most important buildings in the Acropolis. Slaves, of course, cultivated uh, the land, and slaves were uh, serving their masters uh, in their households, uh, cooking, uh, bringing water, uh, washing the dishes, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, the outbreak of the war had very significant consequences on uh, the life of slaves. I give you here a passage from a, a, co a comedy by Aristophanes, uh, presented in the very first uh, few years uh, of the war. Uh, I'll read the passage and then I'll comment on it. Here, uh, the, uh, it's the very beginning of uh, the play, uh, where the speaker uh, says the following. Oh dear, oh dear, oh King Zeus, what a piece of work this night has been. Unending. Won't they ever come? Yet, I heard the cock crow long ago. But the slaves are snoring. They wouldn't have done this before. Oh, war, be damned for the many evils you brought. For now, I can't even punish my slaves. Of course, this is comedy. Nevertheless, it's quite interesting that the speaker thinks that the Peloponnesian War has had a very significant consequence on relationships between masters and slaves. Our speaker uh, is afraid of punishing uh, his slaves in the way he would have done before. He doesn't say why, but as you will see, it's not very difficult to understand why the uh, outbreak of the war has made it much easier for slaves to flee to the opposing side. Therefore, masters have to be much more careful in punishing their slaves and um, creating uh, more reasons for slaves uh, to flee. Now, how exactly was uh, slavery and slaves important for the Peloponnesian War? The first uh, important aspect is that the Peloponnesian War, like most wars in antiquity, were mass processes both of enslavement and of liberation. There were mass processes of enslavement because captives could often be enslaved. enslaved. Not all captives were enslaved, many of them uh, were um, redeemed, uh, but we know of various occasions in which uh, defeated opponents in battle, uh, the conquered population of a city ended up as uh, slaves. Famously, one of the most famous examples is the island of Melos, uh, which the Athenians captured uh, and enslaved the whole population. Uh, one could multiply examples, but thousands of people who were free before the war ended up as slaves in the course of the war. What is interesting is that at the very same time, we see exactly the opposite process. Thousands of slaves finding excellent opportunities during the war to gain their freedom. There were various ways in which this happened. One of these ways was the liberation of the slaves of the enemy party. As you would see, and as we will discuss, one side would uh, attempt to uh, undermine the other side by promising freedom uh, to the slaves of the opposing side. At the very same time, during the war, one of its major consequences was a large number of civil conflicts between uh, opposing sides in the various uh, communities that participated in the war. It's a bit more complicated than that, but let's say that uh, supporters of uh, Sparta and usually oligarchs uh, would use uh, the support of Sparta to undermine uh, their opponents who were usually supporters of Athens. In those civil conflicts, often one or both sides would try to uh, strengthen uh, their hand by inviting slaves to join them to fight their opponents and promising freedom or sometimes even uh, enfranchisement as uh, citizens. And of course, in conditions of warfare, uh, it's much easier for slaves to flee. So the mass desertion of slaves, both from the Athenian side and from the Spartan side, was uh, something that occurred very widely in the course of the war. Um, I give you two passages to illustrate uh, this uh, 
processes. Uh, my first passage is uh, from Thucydides, the famous historian of the Peloponnesian War, and he describes here uh, the civil war in, uh, in Corfu between Democrats and oligarchs. The following day, there were a few skirmishes, and both parties, the Democrats and the oligarchs, sent missions to the countryside, asking the slaves to join them and promising them their freedom. Most slaves allied themselves with the Democrats. 800 mercenaries came from the mainland, uh, modern Hippos, to aid the oligarchs. So as you can see here, both sides try to win this civil conflict by appealing to the slaves and promising freedom. And we have a tantalizing uh, detail that most slaves within a few hours allied themselves with the Democrats. It's, uh, I often ask my students when I discuss this passage, uh, to try to make a movie, how they envisage this thing happening, how they envisage the two sides appealing to the slaves to the countryside, and how they envisage uh, slaves uh, deciding very quickly which side to take. Uh, do people imagine that, uh, you know, in every uh, estate, uh, the slaves gather around, there is a, a, de a deputation of uh, Democrats who present their view, and then the deputation of oligarchs and the slaves vote, not very likely. Did Democrats uh, send people to the estates of the Democrats and oligarchs send people to the estates of the oligarchs? But then why did most slaves decide to support the Democrats? Or, as I think is the most likely scenario here, we have to imagine that slaves have their own communities and their own forms of leadership, and it's that kind of leadership that is able to take decisions for the majority of slaves in such a quick uh, way. We shall never know, but thinking about slave agency is a sort of thing we need in order to interpret such cryptic passages as the one uh, you see here. To give a second uh, example uh, is uh, a situation a few years later, the island of Hios, uh, who was a member of the Athenian alliance. Uh, after the defeat of the Athenians in uh, Sicily, the, the Hians uh, decide to succeed from the Athenian alliance. The Athenians try to recapture the island, and it is within this context that uh, Thucydides informs us about the following. The Hians had many slaves, a greater percentage than any other city, except that of the Lacedaemonians, the Spartans. And because there were so many, the punishments they used to receive for their offenses were harsher. So when the Athenian forces seemed firmly established with a fortified base, the majority of the slaves immediately deserted to them. And as they knew the land well, it was they who caused the greatest harm. The conflict between the Athenians and the Hians is a great opportunity for the slaves of Hios to flee en masse to the Athenians and in that way gain their freedom, but also destabilize the ability of the Hians to defend themselves from uh, their enemies. Apart from that, it's equally important to stress the active military role of slaves uh, in the Peloponnesian War. In theory, uh, warfare was something that involved only three uh, people, citizens, and free foreigners. In practice, in particular in big conflicts like the Peloponnesian War, uh, states had to resort to the use of slaves on a mass uh, scale. This applies both to Sparta, as you will see, Spartans used hundreds of uh, helots, uh, Spartan slaves, uh, in their armies, and they played a crucial role in some of the most important military successes of the Spartans in the war. For the Athenians, uh, that also applies, but the Athenians largely used slaves not in land warfare, uh, but in naval warfare. The Athenian triremes, every trireme had uh, a crew of about 170 people, uh, and a very significant part of that crew could always consist of slaves, but as you will see in particular occasions, the role of slaves in the Athenian Navy was even uh, more uh, significant. The most famous example in this respect uh, is an event towards the end of the war. In 406 BC, uh, the Athenian Navy is besieged in the island of Lesbos, 
So the Athenians have to build a new navy and they have to man the navy. And of course, they don't have enough Athenian citizens to man the navy. So they promised to all slaves who were willing to participate as rowers in the Athenian navy, not only to give them their freedom, but to make them Athenian citizens. Something dramatized in another comedy of Aristophanes, uh, The Frogs, where the god Dionysus goes to the underworld uh, to break back uh, the tragedian Aeschylus, and here talks to his uh, slave Xanthias. Dionysus, well, since you say the donkey doesn't help, suppose you take your turn and carry him. Unhappy rats, why didn't I join the navy? Then I tell you to whistle a different tune. Uh, Xanthias feels sorry that he didn't take the opportunity to participate in the Athenian navy, gain his freedom and become an Athenian citizen, and tell uh, Dionysus to start himself. Uh, this is what uh, the comedy parodies, and the commentaries, the ancient commentaries to the comedy, tell us that uh, thousands of slaves uh, not only won their freedom, but became Athenian citizens as a result uh, of, of this. How exactly did slave agency uh, impact the course and the outcome of the Peloponnesian Wars? I will give you uh, two opposing ways in which slave agency affected both the Athenian side and the Spartan side. So on the one hand, the fear of a revolt by the Helots or even of mass desertion by the Helots was a very important factor that determined Spartan policy. In the early part of the war, uh, the Spartans decided, despite their initial uh, wishes to effectively destroy the Athenian Empire, uh, after a number of defeats and with a growing fear of Helot uh, desertion and possibly even a revolt, they decide that they should seek uh, terms with the Athenians because otherwise they might threaten the uh, future existence of their very state. On the opposing side, Helots played a crucial role in Spartan military successes. If the threat of Helot revolt uh, forced Spartans to behave in certain ways, the ability to use Helots in their armies and uh, have major successes had the opposite effect on Spartan policy. Exactly the same sort of um, opposite forces one can see in the case of the Athenians. I just mentioned the case of the Battle of Argenusa when the Athenians managed to defeat the Spartans because they uh, used thousands of slaves in their navy. As you will see, exactly the opposite. The mass flight of Athenian slaves had a very, uh, very debilitating consequences for the Athenian uh, effort to continue conducting uh, the war. Let me give you uh, two passages that illustrate uh, these uh, opposing tendencies. Here we are talking about the Spartans uh, around 422, just before the end of the first phase of the war, and the thinking of the Spartans who have decided that they should put an end to the first phase of the war by seeking terms with the Athenians. The Lacedaemonians, on the other hand, found the event of the war falsify their notion that a few years would suffice for the overthrow of the power of the Athenians by the devastation of their land. She had suffered on the island a disaster, a third to unknown at Sparta. She saw her country plundered from Pylos and Kythera. The Helots were deserting, and she was in constant apprehension that those who remained in Peloponnese would rely upon those outside and take advantage of the situation to renew their old attempts at revolution. So the fear of Sparta revolt forced the Spartans to seek uh, terms with the Athenians. The very same thing uh, happened also to the Athenians. After the uh, Spartans built a permanent fort in the Athenian territory and effectively gained control of the countryside, Thucydides describes the effects this had on the Athenians. Indeed, since the Kelea had been first fortified by the whole Peloponnesian army during this summer, it had been doing great mischief to the Athenians. In fact, this occupation by the destruction of property and loss of men which resulted from it was one of the principal causes of their ruin. They were deprived of their whole country. More than 20,000 slaves had deserted, a great part of them artisans, and all their sheep and beasts of burden were lost. The ability of the Athenians to conduct the war depended on the silver mines of Labrio. 
a huge output of those silver mines, gave the Athenians the funds to pursue a very costly kind of war, which was naval warfare in antiquity. Once they lost tens of thousands of slaves, they could no longer operate properly the mines, and therefore that had huge consequences for their ability to continue conducting uh, the war. What did it mean though for all those slaves uh, to experience the Peloponnesian War? I give you an example of a funeral inscription. There are tens of books and articles about the Peloponnesian War. Uh, this inscription has been known for more than a century. You will not find a reference to this inscription in any of the books or articles written by the Peloponnesian War, despite the fact uh, that it uh, it illustrates something very significant about the conduct of the war. Now, it is dated to the last quarter of the uh, fifth century. Therefore, it falls squarely within the period of the Peloponnesian War. The best of the Phrygians in the broad lands of Athens was Manes the Orimaian, to whom belongs this fine tomb. And by Zeus, I never saw a better woodman than myself. He died in the war. Now, the fact that he says he died in the war almost certainly must mean that he died fighting uh, for the Athenian army in the course of the war. As you can see, Manis doesn't tell us his actual legal status. He only says that he was from Phrygia, an area in Asia Minor, and a proverbial area of uh, origin of barbarian slaves uh, for Athens. Manis is proud about his ethnic origin, and he's also proud about his, uh, his art as, a, as an artisan, as a, as a woodcutter. Um, we know that uh, manumitted slaves in Athens who uh, stayed in Athens uh, were uh, asked to fight in the Athenian army. So probably Manis was a former slave uh, who fought in the Athenian army and died fighting for the Athenians. In fact, Thucydides mentions uh, a battle between uh, the Athenians and the Spartans in the Athenian territory in a place called Phrygia. Uh, it's likely that it was a place where a lot of Phrygians uh, lived and therefore it might have been named after uh, them. Whether Manis died in that battle or on some other uh, occasion, we, we never know. So here you see the perspective of a person who was probably originally a slave uh, and his experience uh, of what it meant to live during the Peloponnesian War. So I tried to show that although the Peloponnesian War was not a conflict about slavery, and although the Peloponnesian War was not a conflict between masters and slaves, the course and the outcome of the war uh, was uh, strongly uh, shaped by the agency of slaves both the slaves who deserted from the Spartans and the slaves who fought for the Spartans, both the slaves who deserted from the Athenians and the slaves who fought for the Athenians. In one way, uh, had all slaves gone in one direction or the other, the outcome of the war would have been very different. And the fact that the war lasted so long was partly uh, the outcome of the fact that different groups of the slaves acted in completely opposite uh, ways. Now, enough with the Peloponnesian War, I want to move to something completely different, and that is processes of uh, ethnogenesis uh, in ancient uh, societies. Uh, two brief examples. The first example is the ethnogenesis of the Bretians in southern Italy in the fourth century BC, uh, as we shall see, the role of slaves in this process of ethnogenesis. The second example is the ethnogenesis of the Limigantes in the fourth century uh, CE. I start with the first passage by Diodorus. In Italy, there gathered in Lucania a multitude of men from every region, a mixture of every sort, but for the most part, runaway slaves. This at first led a marauding life, and as they habituated themselves to out of door life and making raids, they gained practice and training in warfare. Consequently, since they regularly had the upper hand with the inhabitants in their battles, they reached a state of considerably increased importance. First, they took by siege the city of Terina and plundered it completely. Then, having taken Hipponium, Thuri, and many other cities, they formed a common government and were called Bretians from the fact that most of them were slaves 
for in the local dialect, runaway slaves were called Bretians. Since then was the origin of the people of the Bretians in Italy. The Bretians uh, became one of the most important uh, and powerful communities in southern Italy, and runaway slaves were an important part of the processes of the ethnogenesis of the Bretians. I moved to the fourth century C. Now, uh, modern historians tell us a lot about uh, the revolt of the slaves in Haiti as the only successful slave revolt in global history. In fact, uh, the first successful uh, slave revolt that we know of in global history happened in the fourth century CE. Uh, and it's almost completely unknown, apart from a few specialists. Uh, it has to do with the fact that in um, the area of the Northern Black Sea, um, the Sarmatians used to be the major uh, power in that area until uh, they had to deal uh, with the group called here Scythians, uh, but uh, we are talking about uh, the, the, the Huns uh, that you know about. Uh, and let's see what exactly happened. It was God himself who brought the Sarmatians at Constantine's feet and is more or less in the following matter that he subdued men who exalted in their barbarian spirit. When the Scythians rode, rose against them, the Sarmatian masters gave weapons to their slaves to build up defense against the enemy. As the slaves took control, they raised their weapons against their masters and drove everyone from their native land. They found no other cave from perdition than Constantine. And he, after offering salvation, admitted them all to the land of the Romans. The Sarmatian masters give arms to their, Scythian, to their Sarmatian slaves to fight um, the Scythians. They win, but then the slaves revolt against their masters and force them out of the Sarmatian territory. And later sources tell us that that group of Sarmatian slaves were then known as the Limigantes. So we have a process of ethnogenesis as a result of a successful slave revolt after the slaves were invited to participate in warfare between the Sarmatians and the Scythians. Next example, the so-called, uh, the period of the barbarian invasions. We no longer call that, but let's call it this uh, briefly. Again, the conflicts between the various uh, barbarian groups and the Roman Empire were not a conflict between masters and slaves and didn't have slavery as their main issue. Nevertheless, uh, slaves and the experience of slavery was crucial for those developments. I focus on just one group, the Gauls. Uh, the Goths became predominant in the area where we saw the Samatians earlier, uh, but once uh, the Huns appeared uh, in that area, they chose to flee into the Roman territory. The Romans allowed to, the Goths to move into the Roman territory, but created horrible conditions uh, for the Goths, uh, which led to a revolt of the Goths, and uh, subsequently, uh, the role of uh, enslaved gods in all sorts of conflicts. Um, yes, sorry, uh, I thought I had the passage. Let me be a bit more specific. Thousands of gods who flew to the Roman uh, territory uh, starved because the Romans created conditions in which they didn't have anything to eat because that was a wonderful opportunity for the slave traders to, as the, the sources say, to uh, buy uh, slaves, uh, buy one slave for one dog that the people would actually use to eat. It was such conditions uh, that enraged the gods who revolted and defeated the Romans, famously killing the Roman Emperor Valens in 376 and creating effectively a power that uh, 30 years later uh, would uh, besiege and uh, subdue the city of Rome. And again, uh, by looking at sources, one see how Gothic slaves were often deserved to the Gothic forces and play a significant role in the successes of the Gothic uh, power. My final example has to do with uh, the role of slave agency and cultural uh, change. Just two examples in that respect. The first example uh, is the creation of Roman literature. Uh, for many centuries, there were no written texts uh, in Latin. Uh, the first uh, text of Latin literature was the translation of uh, Homer uh, in Latin by Livius Andronicus, a slave 
uh, from the Greekist. And in fact, uh, most of the early works of Latin literature were created uh, by slaves from the Greek East who uh, effectively put their uh, literary capacities uh, into the creation of a new literature for the new world power of Rome. So it's one of the most fascinating examples in which uh, slaves play a role of cultural transfer of knowledge, abilities, myths, uh, and other information from one culture into another. And finally, the role of slaves as uh, agents of religious change. Uh, anybody who reads the Acts of the Apostles uh, will know that the first uh, pagan convert uh, to Christianity was uh, an Ethiopian uh, royal uh, slave uh, who uh, was um, who met uh, Stephen, uh, the apostle, and was converted by him into Christianity. And in many other occasions, uh, the uh, Christianization of uh, various uh, societies was the result of the actions of slaves. Famously, St. Patrick in Ireland, St. Patrick was uh, uh, a Roman from Britain who was enslaved in Ireland, lived a number of years as a slave, managed to flee and return back in order to Christianize uh, Ireland. Uh, the Christianization of the Goths uh, we mentioned before was the result of uh, uh, enslaved captives uh, whose uh, progeny was Rufilas, the guy who created the Gothic alphabet and uh, played a significant role in the Christianization of the, the Goths. Um, so again, the role of slaves as actors of uh, religious saints. And to finish with the very late antiquity, the sixth century uh, CE uh, is an event in the area of modern day um, uh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it's the country to the south of uh, Saudi Arabia uh, in uh, in the, the Red Sea, uh, Yemen. Sorry. Uh, so uh, the historian Procopius talks here about an invasion of the Christian kingdom of Ethiopia, who invades uh, Yemen in order to overthrow uh, the local uh, power, which is. Uh, pagan and also with uh, significant Jewish uh, presence. Uh, and the Ethiopians successfully in invade, and let's see what happens then. In this Ethiopian army, many slaves and all who were readily disposed to crime were quite unwilling to follow the, the Ethiopian king back to Ethiopia, but were left behind and remained there because of their desire for the land of the Homerite, Yemen, for it is an extremely goodly land. These fellows at a time not long after this, in company with certain others, rose against the king Esimipheus and put him in confinement in one of the fortresses there and established another king of the Homerite, Abramus by name. Now this Abramus was a Christian, but a slave of a Roman citizen who was engaged in the business of shipping in the city of Adelis in Ethiopia. So we are precisely in the period just before the genesis of a new world religion, Islam, in an area with religious conflicts between Christians Jews and pagans, in which an Ethio the, 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 the slaves who participate in an Ethiopian army overthrow uh, the ruler in Yemen and impose a former slave uh, as their own uh, ruler. I think it's a good example of the mixture of religion, ethnicity, and slave agency in uh, the way it changed ancient history. So one can multiply examples, but I think this is what we need ways of integrating slaves uh, into uh, the historical developments in politics, in culture, and religion of ancient societies. It's a world in progress uh, with problems that uh, we can uh, discuss, but I hope I have shown you what can be achieved once we look uh, for, from that kind of point of view. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Costa, for this and uh, for well, it's fascinating of the presentation and so diverse. Um, I think it's from <laughs> from uh, like all parts of the all parts of the Mediterranean, even to the Red Sea, and from well, from uh, the, for the archaic from the uh, classical and archaic period to the late to the late Christian, well, late antiquity, I should say. So we'll be taking, as we said. Uh, 
questions. Okay, people who would like to ask questions can uh, write to me. Just say that you need to have a question to ask, and then we'll uh, unmute you and allow you to uh, ask your question. Um, and then in time, and while people are getting, uh, uh, I mean, people are getting, uh, let me say that, uh, ready. Ah, you can ask one. So. Krit is ready to ask the first question there. The first stone to throw is the one the most difficult always. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not planning to throw stones here, but... Uh, uh, no, I'm yeah. kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a, um, a fascinating uh, talk. And as, as uh, Tassos was already saying, it stretches a huge geographical area already and a very, very long uh, time span. And then, you know, as your pipe dream project would take it even further, um, you know, maybe both in time and in, uh, in, in geographical area. Um, I mean, I just want to ask an, an obvious question and I know it's an impossible question to, um, to respond to, but is slave the same thing in all these places? What, what exactly are we talking about when we talk about slaves? How do we, because there are different names for them, uh, helots, and, and so how, I mean, how do we determine whether someone is a slave or not? Um, yeah, I, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's my question. Um, I, yes, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, I think uh, we have to do two things at the very same time. The first thing is that they are all slaves in the sense that they're all human property. Uh, helots and uh, Athenian slaves are both slaves in the sense that they are the private property of their masters, but they are all have particular characteristics and they have particular characteristics because slavery is inserted in a number of processes and the peculiar characteristics of each society affect um, the history and the condition and the status of those slaves. Uh, the helots were slaves but the fact that the reproduction of this slave population was not through the slave trade, but uh, through the natural reproduction of the slaves, of course, meant uh, that they have different characteristics from slaves who were reproduced through the slave trade. Um, the slaves in Messenia, for example, lived, uh, because the Spartan masters had to live in Sparta, they lived, the, the Spartan masters were absentee landowners. Therefore, helots effectively had similarities with medieval selves because they lived on their own and they surrendered part of the produce to their masters. They were slaves, but because of the peculiar characteristics of their Spartan masters, they developed in particular ways. And the same applies to all uh, slave groups. One of the things we have learned over the last few years is that we should not take Athenian slaves as the uh, essence of Greek slavery and either think that all other Greek uh, city-states with chattel slaves were the same with Athens. And cases like the Helots in Sparta or the slaves in Crete were not really slaves because they have these peculiarities and therefore they are something else. No, we have different groups of slaves who developed in different ways because of uh, processes of divergence, but also processes of convergence. Groups like Helots stopped uh, existing from a certain point onwards. 500 years down the line, the helots of uh, Athens and the, Hel the, the, the slaves in Athens and the slaves in Sparta were much more similar uh, than they were 500 years uh, earlier. So it's by looking at slaves within historical processes that we can see both the similarities and the differences between different, different uh, slave populations. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank you, Rosa. Um, Robin has a question. So, Robin. You need to unmute yourself. Robin, you need to unmute yourself. No, you're still muted. Oh. Uh, all right. Sorry. Um, okay. No, I can't. <laughs> Sorry, I had a, 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 a pop up saying that I could not be un unmute myself. Um, I'd like to follow up that uh, question, uh, Professor Vasopoulos, um, with regard to the, uh, uh, the, the terms, uh, the helots and the, and the doulos uh, and the douloi. 
uh, or Dalai, I don't know how you pronounce it in modern Greek, I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, because initially you said that uh, a slave is, a, uh, is the property of an individual. But my understanding is the helots were not properties, individual helots were not pro the property of individuals, but of the state, that perhaps, that they were, yes, obviously sir. this is an issue which uh, uh, specialists in Greek history debate. Um, yeah. But uh, could you not see, uh, as you find in, in early China, which I will talk about later on, um, that uh, there were different types of slaves and different types of dependencies. In ancient in China, there was certainly a difference between private slaves and state slaves, or and slaves owned by the rulers. So you had at least three different types of slaves, and you had convicts and others, and many different types of dependency. Um, now, when you talk about slaves and they're becoming citizens, it would appear that only those, you're only talking about male slaves. So you need to think about the gender issue because only males could be citizens, but now maybe that changed over time. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the different types of low status dependents in the Greek world. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Again, a very good question. Uh, yes, you are not mistaken that older literature uh, accepted the idea that helots were not the private property of their masters, but were state slaves. The problem with this idea is that it is based on later sources. In the third century BC, there was a revolution in Sparta. A number of kings, Agis and Cleomenes, uh, tried to solve the problem that most of the land in Sparta belonged to very few individuals. And they presented this idea that originally Sparta was a society where the land was owned by the state in uh, 9,000 lots, and each Spartan citizen uh, would get one lot and the slaves to work it. And therefore, they tried to institute this imagined past of uh, Sparta in the third uh, century. They failed. But the sources written after this revolution present this image of Sparta as if uh, it was a society uh, in which uh, uh, the propaganda of those kings was the actual reality. Once one reads the contemporary sources, Thucydides, Xenophon, and so on and so forth, there's no doubt whatsoever that slaves were the private property of the Spartan masters. So I think hardly anyone would dispute the idea that uh, helots were private uh, property. There's a wonderful book uh, by David Lewis, uh, published a few years ago, uh, Greek Slave Systems in the Eastern Mediterranean Setting, which sets out, I think, uh, the evidence uh, quite uh, clearly in that respect. Uh, now, of course, as you say, there were public slaves, there were private slaves uh, in uh, Greek societies. The problem is that as far as we can tell, there is no separate status for public slaves uh, in Greek society. Um, the Greek society seem to operate with a very simple distinction, free and slave. You are either the one or the other. But there are occasions in which they decide to discard this distinction for certain purposes. For example, public slaves can be honored by the states as if they were free. But when they are punished, they are punished, they are punished as slaves. So there is just a single dividing line, no separate status for uh, public slaves. It's just that this single line is applied in different ways depending uh, on, uh, on the context. Uh, the point about gender is, I think, uh, very important uh, because, yes, uh, for most Greek societies, citizenship uh, is effective because citizenship is strongly connected with a, a number of forms of active participation. Uh, citizenship is strongly linked to, to being male. That doesn't mean that female natives were not citizens, 
but with a very few exceptions, we never see women being given uh, the right of citizenship in a foreign community. It does happen sometimes, often in peripheral areas of the Greek world, uh, but it's extremely uh, rare. Uh, therefore, you are absolutely right that uh, the, 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 the cases of, um, of male slaves gaining their freedom and even citizenship is a very different story from what uh, would apply to women. Again, uh, it really depends from one society to another. In certain peripheral Greek societies, for example, in Epirus, we see um, a group of related people manumitting a female slave, and then uh, we see the same group together with a manumitted slave manumitting another slave. And one possibility is that this female slave uh, is either adopted or marries into this uh, group and therefore becomes one of the owners of this, uh, of, of the next uh, manumitted slave. Uh, generally speaking, though, uh, and given what we know, there is clearly a very significant gender imbalance in terms of prospects uh, for male and female slaves uh, and citizenship in Greek uh, societies. If I can just rebound here, Costa, before giving the, the floor to somebody else, um, because of what you mentioned exactly of uh, public uh, private slavery, that distinction, and it's uh, and it's very important, uh, well, both for those who really use very often have as a referential of slavery, what is like African American slavery in the, in the Atlantic world, and uh, it's, for example, thinking the and and the difference with the ancient Mediterranean. Um, and well, among, besides the, the, the racial component, um, which doesn't play there in the Indian Mediterranean, there is this aspect, as you say, of public and private slavery. I mean, what one would have to imagine, for example, that if you're in uh, antebellum United, southern states of the United States, you would have uh, African American slaves running the administration, uh, in a sense, of, the, of, that, of, that, of, that, of that entity. Uh, well, at the same time, you would have uh, private slaves working in plantations or in mines or whatever, but you would have at the same time, you, know, you would have slaves who would be running the administration. And that is what is happening in, in, in the ancient Mediterranean world, is if you're thinking of Athens. On the one hand, you may have the community of citizens, but the community of citizens is not running the everyday administration of the, if I can use the word, state, of the political entity in any case. And, and, um, and this makes me jump like you know rebound on robin's question say i mean you know these people do we have any idea of whether these people you know because of this engagement in the, the administration could develop different attitudes i mean with regards to the people who were just private slaves working in the mines or working in the household as you said or etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean that they, you know there's like a, they, they are as you say i mean yeah. they may be punished as slaves and they are slaves but you know it is different. <laughs> it is. Uh, well, the last speaker in your series, Polenis Mar, has written a wonderful book about uh, uh, Greek uh, public slaves called, uh, in the English translation, uh, Democracy and its Slaves. Uh, and uh, I think he, I mean, the view I presented is the view of Polenis, which is there, uh, which is that there's not, in, in contrast to other societies like uh, Muslim societies or uh, African societies, there's not in in ancient societies, there's not in Greek societies at least, there's not a special status of public slaves legally. That's one thing. In terms of social reality, of course, the condition of those public slaves can be completely different from slaves in the mines. Uh, for example, policemen in Athens were slaves. And of course, we have a situation in which slaves can use force against Athenian citizens, which, of course, in a society like Athens, which is a democracy, this is, of course, bizarre. And you have comedies which illustrate precisely that bizarre point uh, of slaves being able to use force against uh, democratic uh, citizens. Now, Polen's interpretation, which I think is right, is that it is an ingenious way of neutralizing uh, the power of uh, state uh, bureaucracies. Think of um, the police, think of the judicial apparatus, uh, think of uh, bureaucrats in the state. Uh, they are supposed to serve uh, citizens, but often they develop interests of their own. By turning those groups uh, into slaves, you ensure that, you, that 
the citizens have the highest control over what the uh, state apparatus uh, does. Uh, now, in terms of social reality, though, there are, of course, differences, and one of the best ways to see this is the names of the slaves. Uh, now, the Athenians had names uh, that stressed uh, the foreign, the foreignness of slaves, for example, the Thracian, uh, Libyan, and so on, and they also used uh, generic foreign names, for example, Manis, that we saw before, to characterize slaves as foreigners. And the most popular names of slaves are those kinds of names that distinguish uh, slaves uh, from, uh, from Greek uh, citizens. But if you look at the picture as a whole, the majority of slaves in Athens, at least those attested, uh, have names that were also used by Athenian citizens. And when you look at public slaves, almost all public slaves have names shared by Athenian citizens. In general, the more white collar the job a slave had in Athenian society, the more likely it was that he would have an Athenian name and not a name that stressed his uh, alterity, his uh, foreignness. Now, how to explain this? There are a variety of ways. Some slaves were Greek in origin, so they had Greek names. Other slaves were uh, second generation slaves who were born in Athens and therefore had Athenian names because that was, uh, uh, they knew no other country than uh, their city. In other cases, slaves gave themselves names to their children and of course chose to give them names that would distinguish them less and therefore allow them to have less uh, discrimination. Uh, often slaves uh, chose such names to avoid discrimination and we have sources who mention this kind of process but clearly as i said profession also made uh, made a difference so public slaves had better names than uh, slaves in the mines uh, for example so there were differences but these were social differences emerging out of reality and social processes rather than legal uh, differences Thank you. Um, we have a question now from one of our students. So, Olivia, would you like uh, to find, so would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Um, hi. Thank you so much for the talk. It was really fascinating, and uh, I learned a lot. I was wondering. So, do we have any sources about the reactions of the citizens who manumitted slaves in a war context in ancient Greece and? Like, what were their reactions to sorry, the... Sorry, in what context? Um, in uh, in a war context in ancient Greece, like for the Peloponnesian War, for example. What right. were the reactions of the Athenians or the Lacedaemonians who had manumitted enemy slaves? How did they react to those people then entering their own societies? What kind of positions did they occupy? <laughs> Yes, unfortunately, at least for the period we are talking about the Peloponnesian War, we don't have those kinds of sources. But um, Peter Hans, an important historian of Greek uh, slavery, has written a very interesting article precisely about the Athenian reactions to the Battle of Arginusa, because the battle in which the Athenians mass manumitted and emphasized slaves, and uh, they won that battle. After that battle, despite the Athenian victory, the Athenians turned and convicted most of the Athenian generals into death, apparently for not collecting the bodies of the dead, uh, uh, the dead uh, rowers. Um, and Peter has argued that one of the reasons that the Athenians reacted in such a bizarre way towards the generals who had just uh, defeated uh, the enemy was precisely that many Athenians were angry by the fact that the state had confiscated their property and manumitted their uh, slaves, and those slaves now uh, had become uh, Athenian citizens. It cannot be proved on the basis of the uh, actual evidence because no source actually says this, but it's a plausible um, interpretation uh, of what uh, happened. Now, clearly, uh, there were cases in which uh, individual masters who lost their slaves in such occasions would, of course, be very unhappy uh, and very angry about uh, something like that. On the other hand, uh, the intervention of the state uh, to use the property of the citizens for a public end uh, 
uh, was very common in ancient Greek uh, societies. And given the fact that it was obvious to the Athenians that if they lost the war, one major one of the things the Athenians feared was that if they lost the war, the Spartans would do to them what they had done to other Greek communities, enslave them. There's a famous description by Xenophon, the day the Athenians find out a few months later that their navy is lost. They cry the whole night because they are afraid that now they will become slaves. So given the stakes, you might not like that the state confiscates your slaves and makes them free or even citizens, but given the stakes, you might think there's no other uh, possibility. Therefore, you have to accept uh, what, uh, what's happened. So it's often difficult to say what this master thought, but one can expect a spectrum for those who didn't like and didn't accept that sort of thing, to those who acquiesced and those who uh, might have no particular problem uh, to that uh, sort of thing. A few, uh, sorry, uh, to add, uh, just to add something to that. Uh, when the Athenians lost the war, they were not enslaved, but uh, the Athenian democracy was overthrown and uh, there was an oligarchic regime, famously called the regime of the 30 tyrants. This regime was overthrown a few months later by a rebel army that was composed uh, of, of course, Athenian citizens, but perhaps the majority of that army was not Athenian citizens, but uh, free foreigners, many of them former slaves, and also slaves. When the Athenians finally won and restored democracy, there was a big debate what to do with those non-citizens, how to reward them. One proposal was to, to give them citizenship, and another proposal was to give them various honors and privileges, but not citizenship. In the end, the Athenians decided to give citizenship, but that decision was thrown out in the courts for a technicality. So clearly there were debates in Athenian society about what to do uh, with slaves who on the one hand uh, had benefited uh, the city, but on the other hand, of course, there were all sorts of negative reactions towards uh, such uh, slaves. Um, and these debates went on and had various permutations. Thank you. Well, we have like uh, now a question by one of our MA students, uh, Tom with Childs, who would like to ask a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, just to follow up to Olivia's question, really, because um, you talked in the Peloponnesian War context, not just about mass manumission, but also about uh, mass desertion. And I wonder how we're meant to imagine, are, they, are these slaves deserting to the enemy side, or are they simply running away? And if they're deserting to the enemy side, I guess, in a similar way, uh, do we know anything about their fate? Like, do they just become slaves for the other city-state, or do they and some kind of freedom. I wonder if you could talk a bit about that. Uh, yes, both happened. Uh, in the case of the slaves of Athens who ran to the, uh, to the fort of Decelia, uh, we are not 100% certain, but it's very likely that most of them uh, remained slaves, but uh, became slaves of the allies of the Spartans. Uh, of course, from a slave point of view, you might still be a slave, but perhaps it was much better to be a slave in the fields of Boeotia than a slave in the mines of Athens, where conditions were often uh, horrible. In other cases, it's fairly clear that uh, these slaves gained their freedom. The slaves of Chios, for example, uh, gained their freedom and were used by Athens in their military operations. So there was no one single uh, reaction. In certain cases, it meant it meant exchange in slavery in one society with slavery in another, although conditions in the new society might be better. In other cases, it meant uh, freedom uh, and even uh, manumission, uh, in, even emphasizing in certain cases. So its particular case was, was different and has to be studied in its own terms. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Rebecca van der Post would like to ask a question. Yes, hello, thank you so much. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm interested in um, the way that Aristotle understands the dynamic of fabrication and manufacture, um, sort of material change, because this is 
really the basis of his account of being and becoming. And so it's been tremendously influential in the history of metaphysics in, the, in Western philosophy. Um, but Aristotle's model assumes a very tightly controlled process that unfolds as a kind of straight line between intention and outcome. Um, and I think that anybody who actually works with their hands and makes things with their hands know that, <laughs> knows that that's not really the way that things get made. Um, that there's always change, there's always the unexpected, there's always evolution. And what we end up doing is often radically different to what we actually set out to do at the beginning. And so I'm wondering um, if there are accounts, first-hand accounts by um, Athenian artisanal slaves of their own working processes, because I, I would be very interested to read these and to... Um, to actually think about them in the context of how Aristotle understands these questions? Uh, well, <laughs> the, the, the short answer is yes. I'm not sure how valuable it will be for you, but uh, <laughs> one of the amazing documents that emerged over the last 20 years is uh, a letter written by an Athenian slave uh, in the fourth century, uh, who basically writes in the letter to his mother and to another guy called Xenocles, whom he doesn't specify what is the relationship, and describes that he works uh, in, a, in a smith, in a smithy. Uh, is that the word in English? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, and he describes that he, he works in horrible conditions. They beat him, uh, they chain him, and he cannot take it anymore. And he asks his mother and Xenocles to go to his masters and find something better for him. Uh, presumably, he's either a, a, a trainee or he is uh, hired by his masters to work in this uh, foundry. And therefore, he asks the intervention of his social network to convince his masters to uh, put him in some other kind of uh, job. Now, this is a wonderful text in all sorts of ways, both for the horrible conditions of slaves, but also for how they exercise their agency. I'm not certain how much it would help you with the kind of question that uh, you have in mind. Unfortunately, uh, I'm, I'm, I would need to think about it, but my quick question is that we don't really have those kind of texts from Athens. There are texts in the Socratic corpus which have to do with the experience of uh, artisans, which is employed in the Socratic corpus by Xenophon, by Plato, uh, for all sorts of ways. And I don't know if you know the article by Sobak uh, no. in Hesperia, which has, uh, it's uh, a couple of years back, uh, six, seven years, something like that, which looks at the, uh, the knowledge of artisans in Athens and how this was interconnected with the processes of uh, Athenian democracy and also, of course, with uh, the work of uh, the, the Socratic tradition, uh, Plato mm -hmm. and uh, Xenophon. Uh, mm -hmm. And his thesis, which should come out at some point soon, is again about uh, those sort of questions. So maybe that's the closest you can, you can get yeah. to the sort of question you want to ask. Thank you. Can you tell me how to spell his name, please? Yeah, I so, think if you give me a second, I should probably find the reference. Uh, thank you so much. This is so helpful. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Well, I mean, I think well, we had a fair amount of questions and the interesting discussion. Um, so before closing and thanking uh, Kostas Vasopoulos for his uh, wonderful talk and give him time for the reference. I would like uh, just to once again thank everybody for participating in this today and uh, say so, so that our um, lecture series on uh, slavery in uh, the ancient worlds will continue um, next month. Uh, uh, one of the good things of this lecture series is that allows me to do a certain type of uh, ego history because now we go from Greece to my alma mater, Middlebury College. I wanted to Greece to go to Middlebury College. And so we'll have with us uh, Professor Don Wyatt, who's with us also today, who's now gonna talk to us about uh, China and the mitigation of punishments and unexamined aspect of Chinese slavery in antiquity. Um, uh, so it's Thursday, February 17th, 12.30 to 2, you'll be receiving a note to register, but please do, um, before moving then Professor Yates next time around. 
And uh, in the meantime, thank you so much, Kostovlos uh, Rus, for joining us with Crete. It's now a deserved, uh, well, you know, it's going to be dinner time, Greek time, though. Uh, thanks. <laughs> and uh, thank you for this fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I hope I will be able to uh, follow the other lectures because they sound extremely fascinating. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the excellent questions. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.